very thankful to the Almighty God who's made it possible to join you virtually in this very important gathering, the 2023 James McKeon Memorial Lectures. I'm very excited and thankful to God, thankful to our Chairman, the International Missions Director, our General Secretary, and the entire leadership of the Pentecost University for giving me this singular honor of sharing with you on the subject Emerging Cultures and Missions in the Diaspora Lessons for Pentecostal Churches. That is the subject matter for this breakout session. Emerging Cultures and Missions in the Diaspora Lessons for Pentecostal Churches. Permit me to begin this session with a quote that says, Let us note that the missionary encounter with postmodern and emerging cultures requires that we hold together Basilea, which is the reign of God, as the content and goal and incarnation as the essential strategy and as we listen carefully, respectfully, and compassionately to the modern world. Crossing streets and crossing oceans. This is the story of the diaspora Christians. Crossing streets and crossing oceans. I'd like to note that born in Tema, Ghana, I have at this time in my life, in my 40s, spent about half of my lifetime, that is more than 20 years, in the United States of America, a nation considered by many sociologists as the melting pot of all cultures. In other words, the most culturally diverse nation in the world. And so humbly, I have come to find that Pentecostal charismatic ecclesiology will be of very little relevance and of very minimal impact on the nations if the marriage between missions and culture is actually allowed to fail. I want you to read a scripture uh, from the book of Hebrews. Turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We are reading chapter 11, verse 13 to verse 16 in the NIV. It says, And all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Beloved, this is a very simple passage that points to the lifestyle that our fathers, the fathers of our faith, the early believers, embraced. It says they admitted to themselves that they were foreigners and they were strangers. I might call them diaspora Christians because they were going from one city to the other, exercising and expressing their faith and winning souls and planting churches. But that is the life that many of us may have been called to, the diaspora or diasporic type of Christianity. In fact, in the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, the Bible says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things or everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. They were called and they were commanded to go. So diasporic Christians are going Christians. Christians on the move, driving through various cultures and through different nations, different streets, different experiences with the hopes of also sharing their faith with the people they encounter. Nations plus culture equals possessing the nations. When you bring nations and you bring culture together, what happens in that nation is that that nation is being possessed for the Lord Jesus Christ. I intimated earlier on that I've come to find that Pentecostal charismatic epistemology will be of very little relevance and of very minimal impact on the nations if we fail to uphold the relationship between nations and culture. 
You cannot enforce a divorce between the two and still possess nations for Christ. They are intertwined. And we must ensure that this union is leading to the salvation of souls, is leading to transformation of these cultures, all to the glory of the living God. The diasporic nations enterprise. The diasporic nations enterprise. In fact, personally, as a student of nations, who is currently exploring the planting of national churches in this beautiful nation of Indonesia, permit me to note that this presentation is a work in progress. I am building the plane while attempting to fly it. It is important to emphasize that the subject of nations in the diaspora is centered on an understanding that diaspora missiology has everything to do with cross-cultural migrations and also outreaches to indigenous, first of all, in the nations that is hosting these uh, immigrants, and also to upcoming generations. I'd like you to note that I have just drawn attention to the major focus of the diasporic Christians, that the goal is to reach indigenous in these nations where they are hosted, and also to ensure that upcoming generations, second generation immigrant born children of these older first generation immigrants are also embracing the faith and embracing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The challenge of immigrant churches in reaching host nations. In fact, there are approximately 600 diasporic communities in the western hemisphere and the number is rapidly growing for so many of these communities have built homogeneous churches that relate more intently with the culture of their original nations or their birth countries in fact our own Ghanaian community is one such example we have built several homogeneous Ghanaian African churches that sometimes when you walk into one of these odd churches in the United States and in other nations of the world, you might feel like you are in Ghana. That is not to an homogeneous uh, church with the practices, the songs, the dancing, the language, the attitude, the behavior, everything just mimics the original country from where all these immigrants have come from. Of course, there are breakthroughs happening where outreaches are being conducted to, in, uh, to indigents. But I just want to draw attention this afternoon to one of the challenges faced by diasporic churches in some of these uh, nations in the West, in Asia, and other countries. In fact, many of the diasporic communities, Pentecostal and charismatic churches alike, especially of African descent, are now confronted with the call to reach their host nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the major emphasis of the Processing the Nations agenda. The other time our dear chairman was in the United States for the conference and um, one of the major uh, statements he kept repeating was that we are not building Ghanaian churches and that it is important to reach the host nation. In fact, he encouraged and brought on board the American flag, hung it on the back. They actually projected the American flag, saying, This is our goal to reach indigents in that particular nation. Young ones who are being born to our diasporic Christians. Emerging cultures. We may define culture as the integrated systems of beliefs, feelings, and values that are characteristic of a given society. These are the mental maps of the world that define reality for us, which we use for guiding our lives. And let's keep this in our mind. Culture, it is the integrated systems of beliefs, feelings, and values characteristic of any given society. And they are the mental maps of the world which define reality for us and which we use for guiding our lives. In that context, I want to also define emerging culture. When we say emerging culture, our emphasis is that we are drawing or paying attention to the constantly changing nature of today's culture and the rise of newer and wider scopes of beliefs and practices being embraced by an emerging generation of Gen Zs and also the Alpha 
generation. Culture, the gospel, and diaspora missions. There is no gospel except that which is mediated through culture and clothed in human culture. It is assumed that this gospel is inherently translatable. That is the assumption with which we are working. And of course, it is translatable. That the truths of the gospel, which have been clothed in the assumptions of a given culture, can be brought to fresh expression in terms of the assumptions of another culture. We are talking about a gospel that can operate in a culture in Southeast Asia and can also find expressions in Northern Ghana. A, a gospel that is translatable, that carries virtues that can find expressions in various cultures and can bring healing and hope to those cultures. There is evidence supporting this view that I have just put across in the four gospel narratives of the New Testament. In fact, the reason why we have four gospels of the New Testament could as well be that these gospels are relating to specific cultures and meeting specific needs. The same gospel, but it's being translated and being contextualized in various situations and circumstances. The witness we want to bear about the gospel is to emphasize that it is contextual, it is perspectival, and also it is uh, interpreted. It can be interpreted. Now, critical engagements in the diaspora cross-cultural church outreach. We have to look at some of the obstacles that impede the ability of diaspora Christians to engage the culture in which they find themselves. So we're looking at the obstacles, we will also look at the opportunities, and then we will connect that to our outreach to the next generation, and then discuss the way forward. The 8th century uh, prophet Jonah was a nationalistic, ethnocentric prophet. And I'm drawing attention to one of the major obstacles that the diasporic churches face when it comes to breaking forth and being able to win indigenous nations unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jonah, a very ethnocentric prophet who wanted himself and the Jewish nation preserved, but he wanted judgment for the wicked Ninevites. He was literally offended that God will forgive the Ninevite nation, and at the same time, he was content with the fact that his Jewish inheritance was being preserved. In fact, Jonah, by his disposition, committed several instances of theological suicide. He did not want a forgiving God to forgive. He did not want a loving God to find expression in forgiving a nation because his heart was fixated on his own culture, preserving his own culture, which of course Jonah considered superior to any other cultures. He wanted the Hebrew culture preserved, but every other thing is not very important to this prophet. But God is a God of the nations, not just the God of the Hebrews, not just the God of Ghana or Nigeria or the God of Canada or the God of UK. He is a God of the nations. God is present everywhere. And that is what Jonah forgot. He forgot that he, Jonah, was actually a messenger and not a manager of God's mission. We are the messengers who carry this mission to the nations of the world. So Jonah's major problem was ethnocentrism which is valuing your culture above every other culture and forgetting the fact that your way of doing things is not the only way to make things happen and that God has many, many, many cultures on the earth that he places value on. The Jonah syndrome is still prevalent among Christians who hold the critical message for the lost and allow cultural and religious barriers to prevent their access to other cultures. I want to repeat that. The Jonah syndrome is still very prevalent today. It is uh, prevalent among Christians who hold, they literally keep the gospel message and emphasize their culture. They allow religious and cultural barriers to impede their ability to break forth into other cultures. 
you will meet an average African woman in one of our churches who is content with the songs, the traditional aye, ye, ye, aye, ye. She wants to sing that all through her lifetime and doesn't have any passion or interest whatsoever to tweak that song a little bit in order to make room for an indigent to also come into that worship service and feel like this is the presence of God and my culture can find expression in this place. Beloved, even among Africans, you may find one nation, one tribe and culture exhibiting symptoms of superiority over other cultures, over other African cultures, or over national cultures of the same nation, or even over the, the, the nation in which they are they find themselves. This attitude is seen among Africans, in fact, it is seen among Americans, it is seen among Asians, it is seen among blacks and whites. People tend to value their culture and consider their culture as superior to all other cultures. And that is a problem when it comes to being able to break forth with the good news of the gospel. If you find yourself in another culture as a diasporic Christian, you will have to open up your mind and understand that God is the God of all the cultures. And he wants us to exhibit these values and principles of the kingdom that we may caption as kingdom culture with which we can break through and possess all cultures for the Lord Jesus. Now, there are two dispositions of the diaspora Christians. Two general dispositions of the diaspora Christians. Number one, it is the fact that some believe that the rest is the best or the rest is the worst. What is the meaning of this? The belief that many Christians or some Christians have in their mind that Western culture is the worst culture ever. Some also have in their mind that the Western culture is the best culture. Now, when it comes to the Bible and comes to theology, both positions are actually dangerous. Both positions must be subjected to biblical scrutiny. In fact, ethnocentrism is a general syndrome that can impede our chances of possessing every tribe, culture, and nation for Jesus Christ. The Jonah syndrome will throw out of the door the love your neighbor concept, love your neighbor as yourself concept, and then choose flight, fear, and deaf ears rather than shake hands and show the love of God to that Muslim neighbor. That is the Jonah syndrome. You know, ignore other cultures, be afraid of other cultures, throw them out of the window, avoid shaking hands with the unbeliever, with the unsaved person of this other culture, and then preserve yours and live only for yourself. But may the Lord have mercy on us and save us from the Jonah syndrome. The lack of cross-cultural skills. That is the second um, element, the second uh, attitude that can prevent diasporic Christians from being able to break forth into other cultures. And these are vital lessons for Pentecostals and also for Charismatics. Even as we seek to break out into the nations and we seek to possess these nations for Jesus. Some of us listening right now, maybe in the next month or in the next year, you may find yourself as being part of this group of diasporic Christians. And you may have to find a way to become culturally relevant and be able to convey your faith to the people around you because that is our primary responsibility and primary goal in this life. The lack of cross-cultural skills can be a major impediment to the success of diasporic churches. The lack of cross-cultural skills in a diaspora missionary or local church can result in frustration, loneliness, and disappointment in the mission field. All right? As the world races towards a much smaller, condensed, and multicultural structure, Pentecostal and charismatic churches that seek to remain relevant must get intentional about training members and equipping them with the necessary skills to handle people of other cultures who show up in our midst. There must be intentionality for all Pentecostal and charismatic churches in training our members 
about how to be culturally relevant. Bringing our members to understand that it is important to truly love your neighbor as yourself, regardless of that neighbor's color, that neighbor's language, that neighbor's background. Cultural sensitivity is a huge requirement for successful mission to our global world. Lack of intentionality in retaining second generation members is another huge problem that the diasporic Christianity uh, actually uh, faces or diasporic Christians do face. Several major immigrant churches ranging from those that are African to the Chinese, the Korean churches, many have reported silent exodus of second generation children of immigrant parents who don't come back to their mother church after graduating from college. This is happening not only in African churches, but in the Chinese communities as well, in the Korean communities, that their younger generation get to college and they don't want to come back to their mother churches. In fact, it's been said that 66% of Americans between 23 and 30 years old once said they stopped attending church on a regular basis for at least a year after turning 18. The, the moment they turn 18, they are off to college. Church becomes unimportant in many, many ways. And this is one of the major trends that is affecting the work of the Lord in the Western Hemisphere and also in the diasporic mission field. But how can we be proactive? How can we be proactive in a fast-changing culture? Face the realities of changing trends in an emerging culture. You know, we must face the reality. We must understand that these departures are real. Sometimes we don't want to speak the truth that we are losing young people from our churches. A culture of our young people ought to be studied. And we need to come to that place where we understand that we cannot put new wine into old wine skins. We cannot carry the culture of the old and try to uh, integrate it and force it down the throat of young people who have acculturated into other newer cultures. The another, another problem that we've all got to keep in mind is that this, the culture we find in the Western um, world, the reality of the youth's world. The Gen Z's talking about the alpha generation and upcoming generations. In their never dying search for meaning and purpose, the youthful generation is inclined to depend on technology to make sense of the world around them. They are using the screens in their pockets as their counselors, as their entertainers, as their instructors, and even as their sex educators. In fact, over here in Indonesia, I have a, gen a young man right here who is helping me put these things together. And he was speaking to his phone, uh, using uh, Siri, and having the phone respond, and just talking to technology and trying to find solutions from technology while just having technology communicate back to him on the needs and the questions that he has. In fact, technology has become a major, major part of the life of our young people. They live in a digital space and will talk much less to human instructors and church leaders. They are asking, why make the effort to talk to church leaders and parents when you can privately ask the smartphone in your hands? Hmm. So these are the realities we are facing with the next generation, with the kind of young people we want to retain on the mission field. And Pentecostal and charismatic churches must see this whole field of young generation, the teenagers, the 13 year olds, the 14, 15, 16 year olds, is a ripe harvest field in the diaspora that efforts must be made to win them, to retain them. The challenge with retaining our young people. Our young people have this position that they have moved on from Christianity. A lot of young people to be lots of them. They believe they've moved on from Christianity. They feel as though they have broken out of constraints, especially when they get to college. They feel Christianity kept them stuck in a box to become someone other than themselves. The young adults' location in a post-Christian culture encourages them to actually reject the authority of the Bible and the spiritual leaders. Now, I want to quickly highlight, to finish up this session, keys that unlock cultures to the gospel 
in the diasporic mission field, which will be very, very important for Pentecostal charismatic churches to embrace. Opportunities. Number one opportunity is the power of language in culture. When you get into a new culture, it's important to start learning the language. In the diasporic mission field, language is huge, a huge deal when it comes to breaking through in that culture. And so the power of language. In scriptures, we see many instances of how language brought salvation or led people to accomplish very spectacular feats because there was language um, power being engaged. The power of building cross-cultural relationships. The power of building cross-cultural relationships. In communities where the gospel is singled out and antagonized, deeds of love and charity can open the door for friendship and dialogue, which eventually can lead to the sharing of the gospel. And so it is so important. Building cross-cultural relationships, these are opportunity givers for us when it comes to being successful on the mission field. Then, silver and gold versus the gospel. If you read Acts chapter 3, verse 6 to 7, you will see the Bible making it clear how Peter, uh, Peter and, and, and John met this man at the beautiful gate and they said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we give to you. This presents to us a voice that identifies two categories of Christians yet again. Those who prioritize just preaching the gospel alone to people, number one, and then those who believe that after preaching the gospel, you need to practically give something to help alleviate pain and suffering. And there are also those who want to just do only social work without preaching the gospel. But on the mission field, what we want to emphasize is that it is not an issue of the priorities or the holies in terms of how and when and how you can be successful. The lesson learned from the mission field indicates that you cannot separate the two. You cannot just be a priorist who only preaches the gospel of Jesus and then you walk away. But when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the need, there is a need for you to also pay attention to the social or socio-economic needs of the people. In fact, just last week we visited, we visited a homeless uh, facility where we went and ministered the gospel to these wonderful men and women who are gathered there. We cannot go and visit such a congregation or such a group and then walk away without doing anything. You preach the gospel, you also show the love of God, practically speaking. And it is a vital lesson that most Pentecostals and Charismatics are embracing and which we fully encourage. Lastly, missional churches in the diaspora. Missional churches will find several opportunities for outreach through the building of rock-solid relationships or cross-cultural relationships in the various locales or locations they find themselves. The key to building relationships cross-culturally is to understand our own cultural lenses and the lenses of others because each culture has a unique way of seeing life and relationships. Our way of doing things is not the only way. Our attitude in approaching other cultures must be that of humility as we see God in the relationship building efforts. Rather, I want to appreciate every one of you for taking the time to listen. I must end by noting that I uh, haven't been faced with, or uh, we've been faced with a rapidly changing and emerging culture. We have considered some of the key challenges or obstacles faced by diaspora Christians on the mission field. These include ethnocentrism, a lack of cross-cultural skills, lack of intentionality in retaining the newer generations in the church. And we have also reflected on the opportunities that we can harness to actually maximize our impact on the mission field. These include the benefit of language, knowing language, cross-cultural relationships, not taking just the silver and gold approach, but preaching the gospel, as well as showing practical love by giving to the poor and helping to impact communities. In fact, over here in Indonesia, there are many times I've used the example of the prisons that we've built, Church of Pentecost has built in Ghana. Whenever I use that as an example, it fascinates 
the people around me for a church to break out into the community and help the government literally building a prison and changing the lives of prisoners that is possessing the nations that is real christianity and that is what we are advocating for even in the diaspora world we ought to be able to push for these kinds of changes in our communities with such lessons as have been put across Pentecostal and charismatic churches will be able to break new grounds and accomplish great feats for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. Terry Makasi in a beautiful Indonesian language. God bless you.